So welcome to Road to 250. Today we'll talk about nephritic versus nephrotic syndrome. And we'll talk about the detailed review of each diseases within each syndrome. So there's a few that we'll cover today. So getting right into it, we're going to first talk about glomerular filtration barrier. And this is basically responsible for fil filtration of plasma according to its size and charge selectivity. And it's composed of uh, three different things. One, you have your capillary endothelium. You have your basement membrane. And then you have your podocytes. So the capillary endothelium is basically a fenestrated endothelium, which has openings. Um, and only small molecules, such as 40 nanometers, uh, pass through. And they repeal red, blood, red cells, white cells, and platelets. And this is the first barrier to filtration. Then you have your plasma membrane, which is basically negatively charged proteins, and it's made up of type 4 collagen and heparin sulfate, which are both negatively charged. And the job of the uh, basement membrane is to repeal, uh, or yeah, repeals uh, negative molecules like albumin, and also has a size barrier, so only small molecules pass through. And as we know, that albumin is a major protein, and it's the most oncotic pressure. It controls the oncotic pressure in the plasma, and the size of albumin is about 3.6, so it can fit through all these barriers, and it's negatively charged. Um, so by the basement membrane, it should repeal. Uh, you have your podocytes, which are basically called epithelial cells. So they're long processes called foot processes that wrap the capillaries, and there are slits between each of these foot processes that filter the blood. So as you can see, there's gaps between them. And these are further sized barriers, so only smaller molecules will pass through. So just covering from first aid, um, we've talked about what they're composed of in detail, but I just need you guys to know that this is a charge barrier and all three layers contain negatively charged, even though I may not have said that. Um, so basically they prevent the entry of negatively charged molecules like albumin and the size barrier, as we've discussed, uh, first thing's a bit different than the numbers that I have, um, but again, uh, you want to know that they prevent the entry of molecules that are greater than 50 to 60 in the basement membrane and the slit diaphragm, and then the capillary endothelium prevent entry of greater than 100, so it's a bit, the numbers are a bit different. So we're going to talk about glomerular diseases, and the spectrum is you have nephritic syndrome or nephrotic syndrome, and uh, nephritic syndrome, you're going to most likely see red blood cell cast, mild proteinuria, renal failure, which is nephrotic. Nephrotic syndrome, you're going to see massive proteinuria and hyperlipidemia. And I'll cover the symptoms that you'll see in each in the next couple slides. And just know that hematuria, there's many, many causes. Uh, most common, you can think of like UTIs or kidney stones. But the feared cause when you have hematuria is bladder cancer. And... Basically, when you have glomerular bleeding, it causes red blood cell casts. Uh, you can have dysmorphic red blood cells or acanthocytes. Um, so those are possible other things that you may see. So what we're going to do next is basically go through the difference between nephritic versus nephrotic syndrome. Um, but some things that you want to keep in mind as we're moving along, that it's important to know that the site of glomerular injury is a major determinant as to which disease process um, leads to either nephritic or nephrotic syndrome. So if you have a protocytes which are injured, it basically leads to a protein loss only, and that causes a nephrotic syndrome. But if it affects the endothelial or mesangial cells, you're basically exposing the, red, uh, the blood elements, and that will lead to inflammation. And that can be, that leads to further loss of red blood cells and protein. So this is a big difference that you will see um, in protocytes versus endothelial or mesangial cells. Um, some nomenclatures to keep in mind, because we will cover a few of these, not all, but a few. Uh, focal, um, that's when you have less than 50% of the glomerular are involved. So an example that we'll cover today will be focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. You can have the diffuse type, which is greater than 50%, and that's diffuse proliferative glomerular nephritis. Um, when you have a pluripotive, uh, pluripotive type, which is hypercellular uh, glomeruli, 
that's your membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis. So, um, and basically when you have a membranous uh, glomerular disorder, it's the thickening of the glomerular basement membrane and that can lead to membranous nephropathy. Um, and then these other ones we'll talk about in detail coming up as we move along. So what we're gonna talk about first are gonna be your nephritic syndrome. So nephritic syndrome is basically inflammatory process that damage the entire uh, glomeruli and it's the filtration barrier to red blood cells and protein loss. So glomerular damage will decrease your GFR and you will see red blood cells in the urine, either as dysmorphic or red blood cell cast. And you'll also see protein in the urine. However, the protein will be less than the nephrotic syndrome and that's due primarily due to the lower GFR. So the number that you will see is less than 3.5 grams per day. So a classic presentation of a nephrotic syndrome would be a dark urine because it has red blood cells. You may see swelling, fatigue because of uremia and protein will be less than 3.5. All right, so this slide, um, basically you wanna think when there's a decrease in the filtration barrier, as you see in nephritic syndrome, you have a decrease in the GFR, and that decrease in the GFR leads to an increase in the BUN or creatinine ratio. And the decrease in the GFR will also uh, increase your hydrostatic pressure, and that will lead to hypertension and edema because your fluids will uh, drive into the space. Because you have increased hydrostatic pressure, the fluids will drive into your space. Uh, when you have protein urea, because you have protein loss, and that will decrease or lose oncotic pressure, and that's another way that you're going to see edema in a patient with nephritic syndrome. And you also see oligouria because you have decreased urine production. And you see dysmorphic red blood cells or red blood cell cast because your red blood cells are spilling in the urine. So essentially, this is like the mechanism behind it. Now, remember what I had said earlier, that you want to make sure the site of injury for nephritic syndrome is going to be your endothelial or mesangial cells. And that's primarily due to because you're exposing the red blood element leads to inflammation, and then that will lead to a loss of red blood cells and protein. And most of the causes of nephritic syndrome are related to the endothelial and mesangial injury with influx of inflammatory cells. So let me ask you guys a question. Can you guys name me some major causes of nephritic syndrome? What diseases are related to nephritic syndrome? Strep. Correct. Well, that should have come up first. <laughs> All right. So you have post-streptococcal, as you said, and um, you also have your burgers or IgA nephropathy diffuse proliferative glomerular nephritis, rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, Alport, and whoa. And then this one, membrane proliferative. We're gonna talk about this at the very end because it's a unique one that can present as either nephritic or nephrotic. So I kept that till the end. Um, so with nephritic syndrome, keep in mind, it's due to the glomerular basement membrane disruption, and that will lead to hypertension, increase in BUN creatinine, um, hematuria, red blood cell cast in the urine, and you have subnephrotic range of protein in the uh, blood or urine, so it's going to be less than 3.5. Uh, but in some severe cases, maybe closer to the nephrotic range, so just look at the signs and symptoms as well. All right, so let's get right into it with prostreptococcal glomerulonephritis. So this basically follows a group A beta hemolytic strep infection. And usually you see these infections in impetigo or pharyngitis um, and occurs with nephrogenic, uh, nephritogenic strains. Well, what I mean by that, it carries a specific subtype of M protein and that's the virulence factor for this uh, bug. And remember that uh, group A beta hemolytic strep infections can also cause a rheumatic fever but it can't cause rheumatic fever and post uh, copal glomerulonephritis. It can do one or the other, and that's specifically due to this 
M protein because you have different M proteins for glomerulonephritis and different M proteins for rheumatic fever. So these are common in children, but can also occur in adults. And a classic case that you might see would be a child who has a two to three week post strep throat infection, who has uh, hematuria, oligouria, hypertension, and periorbital edema. So you'll see immune complex deposits in the kidney, and that's due to circulating antigen antibody complexes. Um, and so basically they form and they go into the kidney. And that what that does will it will fix complement and attract uh, PMNs, and that will lead to hypocomplementemia. I think I screwed that up. But uh, your glomeruli will be enlarged and hypercellular on H and E stain. And this is an example of what you can see in your glomeruli. It's a uh, hypercellular and enlarged compared to the other ones. And uh, your subendothelial antibodies. Uh, complexes, you see granular IGF because you have IgG and C3. So it has like a bumpy appearance and I have a picture of that. So kind of want you to focus on the left side. So when you look at it right here, it kind of looks bumpy. It's not like linear. Um, and we have an example of those coming up as well. And when you look at the sub epithelial, you'll see humps due to these immune complexes. And an example of that is right here. You have your sub epithelial hump, um, and that's due to the immune complexes that basically are formed. So it has good prognosis in children, and however, the adults have a worse prognosis, but only about 60% will recover from a prostatal infection and may develop renal insufficiency. And this can actually show up 10 to 40 years after the initial illness, and they can develop rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, but that's only in about 25% of cases. Uh, treatment is supportive, and then there's a spontaneous resolution. So looking at first aid, um, basically all that I've covered, but just to do for repetition, uh, most frequently seen in children about two to four weeks after a group A streptococcal infection of the pharynx or the skin, and it results spontaneously in most children, but can progress to renal insufficiency in the adults. Um, it's a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, so keep that in mind. And it presents with peripheral and periorbital edema. You have your cola-colored urine because of the RBCs and hypertension. And then you have decrease in the complement levels due to its consumption because it's basically forming the complement or antigen antibody process. So um, Here's a picture of a glomerular that's enlarged and hypercellular. Just another example for you guys to look at if the first one didn't kind of prove it to you. Um, just gives you a better idea and a different look. In immunofluorescence, you may either see a starry sky or a granular lumpy bumpy appearance, and that's due to your IgG, IgM, and C3 deposits along the basement membrane in mesangia. And electron microscopy, uh, scope you'll see sub epithelial immune complexes and that's due to the humps and you can see that variously oh sorry this is your lumpy bumpy right here in this picture or starry sky as you like to say so any questions before we move on to the next one mm -hmm. all right so next one, we'll talk about iga nephropathy and this is the most common form of glomerulonephritis worldwide. Um, and it, basically, it has repeated episodes of hematuria, and it's due to an overactive immune system. So your IgA synthesis increases in response to triggers such as a respiratory infection or a GI infection, because as we know, IgA is a mucosal uh, and, um, antibody. So when you have IgA immune complexes in the mesangium, it, it typically does not activate complement. However, in this disease process, it can activate complement very weakly, and thus you may see a glomerular injury. So when you look at a granular, uh, you'll see a granular immunofluorescence, and that's typically stained for IgG or IgA. So a classic case that you may see is uh, recurrent episodes of hematuria since childhood, 
um, episodes following an upper respiratory infection or a diarrheal illness. And basically, you see slowly worsening real function. So your BU and creatinine will increase over time. And possible progression to end-stage re renal disease, but that takes about 20 years. However, just keep in mind with this one, don't confuse it with other glomerular disorders. And by that, I mean your post-strep glomerulonephritis takes, it occurs weeks after the infections. However, IgA occurs days after the infections. So that's a big key right there, um, timeline. Um, and in nephrotic syndrome, you have a minimal change disease that occurs after upper respiratory infections, but you'll see greater protein value in that disease process. And this is a picture of your IgA nephropathy and what it would see. You're basically staining it for um, its granular appearance, and you see a bunch of IgA. So uh, basically a tie-in that you may run across is Enoch, Scholl, and Purpura. Um, and that's when you have IgA nephropathy with extra renal involvement and most childhood uh, or most common childhood systemic vasculitis or vasculitis. And signs and symptoms of this disease, you'll see palpable purpura on the buttocks. Uh, your GI, you're going to see abdominal pain or melena. And you may see joint pain and there's diffuse IgA depth deposition. And when you do a tissue biopsy, you'll see IgA. So again, going back to first aid, you get episodic hematuria that occurs concurrently with respiratory or GI infections because IgA is secreted by mucosal linings and renal pathology of IgA vasculitis and phenoxial and uh, purpura. And under light microscopy, you'll see mesangial proliferation and immunofluorescence. You'll see IgA-based immune complex deposits in the mesangium and electron microscope, you'll see mesangial ice immune complex deposit, deposits. So next we'll talk about diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. Okay, so I was going to ask that question, but I guess I'll skip it. The first thing that comes into mind when you think of diffuse glomerular, uh, diffuse proliferative glomerular nephritis would be SLE, because it's the most common subtype of SLE renal disease, and this often presents with other SLE features, such as fever, rash, and arthritis. And when you look at biopsy, you'll see immune complex that deposit in the glomeruli. So... Basically, when you have immune complexes, it's an inflammatory response, and you'll see granular immunofluorescence, as you see right there. And uh, why is it diffuse? Because it's more than 50% of the glomeruli are affected, and it's proliferative because it increases cellularity of the glomeruli and the mesangial cells and the endothelial cells. And you also see monocytes and neutrophil infiltration in this. So that's why you can name it diffuse and proliferative and same word. And your subendothelial deposits drive the immune response. And the classic finding that you'll see are capillaries that loop, uh, capillary loops are thickened or it's called wire looping. So they may say something like, oh, there's a wire looping or they might just kind of describe a wire looping. So that's when you have subendothelial deposits that drive the immune response. And here's a picture of what it would look like. Um, oops, I kind of covered that. But with a often due to SLE, so think wire lupus if that helps. And you can see diffuse proliferative or membrane proliferative. And we'll talk about the other one later. And often presents as nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome concurrently. So these are the ones that can occur in both ones either as nephritic or nephrotic, but we covered it mostly in the nephritic syndrome. Um, and light microscopy, you'll see wire looping of the capillaries, and then with immunofluorescence, you're gonna see granular appearance. Um, and then with electron microscope, you'll see subendothelial and sometimes intramembranous IgG based on immune complex, often with C3 de deposits. So you're gonna see both IgG and C3. All right, so the next one we'll talk about is the rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And this one's also called uh, crescentric glomerulonephritis because your crescents are formed uh, by inflammation. 
Um, and then there's so severe forms of glomerulonephritis, and you see progressive loss of renal function, and it has a rapid onset. So often presents as an acute renal failure with generalized symptoms, such as fatigue and anorexia. And it causes distinguished based immunofluorescence. Or, I mean, you can distinguish the different causes based on immunofluorescence. And there's three types. You have uh, a linear immunofluorescence. There's a type 2, which is a granular immunofluorescence. And then a type 3, which is negative immunofluorescence. And there's a good review chart from Pathoma that I will cover in the next slide. But here's a picture of a, basically a crescent or a crescentic glomerulonephritis. And this is a normal section. I probably should use a better color. Um, this is a normal section. And then you can see here I don't know, that it's like a crescent shaped. And this is the disease process right here. And there's fibrin and macrophages that are present in this. So this is a table that I took directly from uh, Pathoma. So when you have a linear um, immunofluorescence, so this is the immunofluorescent pattern, you have an anti-basement membrane antibody, and that's typically seen in good pasture's disease. But can you guys tell me when you see anti-basement membrane antibody, what type of hypersensitivity reaction it is? All right, so this one is uh, type 2 hypersensitivity, and that's because your antibodies are going against the tissue antigen. Um, and in good pastures, does you have antibodies against um, the alpha 3 chain of the type 4 collagen. So a classic case of this would be a young adult who's a, usually a male and has hemoptysis and hematuria. So a lung involvement as well as a kidney involvement. So keep that in mind. So as it's seen right here. Now, the second type, which is type 2, you're going to see a granular immunofluorescence. So when you think granular, think of immune complex deposits. And that's usually seen in um, PSGN or, or diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis. Um, this is post streptococcal, by the way, PSGN, if you guys were confused, and that's more common. Um, what type of hypersensitivity reaction is it if it, the immune complex are depositing? Three. Type three, yeah. Good job. Um, and basically the, oops. Okay, so the diffuse peripheral glomerulonephritis is due to the diffuse antigen antibody complex and usually subendothelial and most common type of renal disease and SLE as we have previously discussed. Now, the last one is a negative immunofluorescence, also called Fossey immune. So Fossey immune is basically nothing is lighting up. So when you look at these patients, you're gonna see no staining for any of these, IgA, IgG, or any other ones. And most of these patients are ANCA or ANCA positive. And we've kind of gone over some of these in previous lectures, but uh, uh, Wegener's granulomatosis is associated with C ANCA. And then the rest are your microscopic polyangitis and Turk Strauss are associated with P ANCA. And you'll see glomerulitis, glomerulus, wow, granulomatous, wow. Inflammation, eosinophilia, and asthma, which distinguish church trials from microscopic polyangitis. Now, do you guys know um, why it's C versus P? Like, what is the differentiation factor there? The central and hairy something. Right. So, uh, the one P anchor is like adjacent to the nucleus, and C anchor is by the cytoplasm. So that's something that uh, you can keep in mind. So here's a basically a summary slide of rapidly progressive. Um, so you, patients will come in with fatigue, anorexia, or acute renal failure. Um, you're going to get nephritic urine. You're going to do a renal biopsy. 
unlike microscopy, you're going to see crescents. And then you can go and either type 1, type 2, or type 3. And this basically gives you a better breakdown. And if you don't want to study all of that, but what type 1, type 2, and type 3 do. And this is from first aid. These patients are have a poor prognosis. They have rapidly deteriorating renal functions, so within days to weeks. And you see crescent moon shapes. And I think I forgot to put the picture in here. And they consist of fibrin and plasma proteins like C3B and with parietal cells, monocytes, and macrophages of what present in the light microscopy. And several disease processes will basically uh, will depend on the uh, immunofluorescent pattern, and we've discussed that in good detail, but here it is again. Good pastures is a type 2, and plasmapheresis is the treatment. And then you have your negative immunofluorescence, or posse immune, and that's due to granulomatosis with polyangitis, or Wegner's, and then your microscopic polyangitis is the other one. And if you have granular, you're going to get uh, post-streptococcal or diffuse pleurophyte. So, good way to review here. Next, we'll talk about Alport. Alport is basically a genetic type 4 collagen defect, and it's a mutation of the alpha 3, alpha 4, alpha 5 chains. I'm not sure if you really need to know, but these chains are, are found in your basement membrane, kidneys, ears, and eyes. It's an inherited X-linked disorder, so you're going to see a lot of males being affected. Um, actually, more in boys. So the classic triad that you're going to see is hematuria, hearing loss, and ocular disturbance. So if you look for a child with the triad and family history, it's usually outboard. Um, it's X-linked dominant, so eye problems, you have glomerulonephritis or sensory oral deafness. So can't see, can't pee, can't hear a beat. That's one way you can think. And electron microscope, you see a basket weave appearance. So any questions about the nephritic syndromes before we move on? As I get situated. All right. So what we'll switch topics to nephrotic syndrome. So like we talked about in the previous one, what I'm going to do is kind of go through this chart real fast, and then we'll move right into the disease process. So in nephrotic syndrome, the biggest thing that you want to worry about is a loss in protein. Because you're losing a great amount of protein, um, you're going to see proteinuria and frothy urine. And because you're losing protein, your albumin levels are going to be low. So there's multiple things that can happen because your albumin is low. When your albumin is low, your plasma oncotic pressure is also going to be low. And that will lead to edema. As we've discussed in previous lectures about how the oncotic pressure works. Um, however, because your plasma oncotic pressure is low, you can also get a low uh, circulating volume and a low GFR. So because of these low GFRs, your renin angiotensin aldosterone system will increase. And because they're kick driving, you're going to have sodium water retention, and that can also lead to edema. Um, when your albumin is also low, your liver can't keep up with the losses because it's trying to make more, create more, it increases the activity of albumin. Um, and that also somehow leads to total cholesterol and LDL increase, so you can get hyperlipidemia. But your HDL levels here will be normal in a patient. So if you're looking at a lipid profile, their HDL levels are going to be just normal. But your LDLs and total cholesterol will be high. And obviously, when you have hyperlipidemia, um, you're going to have fatty casts that are going to be present. And then you can also see oval fat bodies. And another thing, because you have a decrease in protein, you also somehow lose clotting factor um, or antithrombin 3, which then leads to thrombosis um, because it's you're losing the clotting factor. And with the decrease in proteins, you can also lose immunoglobulins. And these patients will typically have, some of these patients will have a higher risk for infections. So just a breakdown of how this works. And we cover... All that again here. So you have massive, prote massive proteinuria, so greater than 3.5, which is different from the nephritic syndrome, which was less than 3.5. Uh, 
And you also have hypoalbuminemia, and that results in edema, hyperlipidemia, and probably urine with fatty casts, as we've covered. Um, and then we'll talk about the disruption of the glomerula filtration, uh, maybe based on several things. Direct sclerosis of the podocytes, um, as we've said, affecting the podocytes will lead to um, increase in protein loss or secondary process such as diabetes that damage the podocytes. So what do you think of nephrotic syndrome? Think of podocytes. And then severe nephrotic syndrome may present with nephrotic features, um, but if the damage is the uh, glomerular basement membrane severe enough uh, to damage the charge barrier. So if the charge barrier is gone, you may see an increase in the protein loss. And this is associated with the hypercoagulable state, as we've discussed, because of the anti-thrombin-3 loss in the urine. So, and apparently also has an increased risk of infection because of immunoglobulin loss in the urine and soft tissues compromised by edema. So I just wanted to cover that um, before we move forward because I think it's very good. So a classic presentation for these patients will be a patient who has a frothy urine, swelling of their ankles, swelling around their eyes, their total serum cholesterol will be greater than 300, protein urea greater than 3.5. And do you guys know the causes of nephrotic syndrome? I said one before, which was your minimal change disease. Um, you have your focal segmental membranous nephropathy, uh, diabetes, and amnibusis. And then again, like I said, we'll leave this membrane proliferative for the very end. So again, this is the same picture kind of with the previous uh, slide, but just wanted to cover uh, what diseases and if they're primary effect or secondary. Most of these are primary or secondary, except amyloidosis, which is just due to the secondary podocyte damage or diabetic as well. So let's jump right into minimum change, minimal change disease. Um, in these patients, it's basically a problem with effacement of the foot processes, so effacement of the podocytes. So this is what you would see in a normal capillary basement membrane podocytes, what it would look like. However, when you think of minimal change disease, you want to think of the flattening of the foot processes. So your podocytes here are basically flattened. And then I have a better picture. Um, this is just a cartoon version, but there's a picture that I have on the next slide that'll help you understand. So this is causing a loss of uh, anion, so the negative charge barrier on the basement membrane. And this process is usually triggered by cytokines, which damage the podocytes, and it's usually idiopathic. However, there is some association with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the pathophysiology behind the Hodgkin's lymphoma is massive production of cytokines by the reed sternberg cells. So that's the only way that this process works with Hodgkin's is the cytokines that are produced by reed sternberg cells will uh, basically cause the effacement of the foot processes. So when you think of renal biopsy with minimal change disease, it's going to be normal light microscopy, normal immunofluorescence. The only finding that you'll see is an effacement of the foot processes on electron microscope. And I have a picture of that on the next slide. So when you think of the disease, sometimes it has immunological triggers. So these occur like days before the actual disease, and that could be due to an upper respiratory tract infection, or allergic reaction such as a bee sting, or recent immunization. And I spelled that wrong. Um, minimal change disease also goes through selective proteinuria. So only albumin in the urine and not immunoglobulins. This is different from most of the nephrotic syndromes, um, but this is the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome in children and usually presents as a child with a recent upper respiratory tract infection. Has a favorable prognosis and responds well to steroids. Um, this is, again, a unique feature about minimal change disease because not other, none of the other nephrotic uh, diseases or syndrome, or diseases in the nephrotic syndrome respond well to steroids. Um, and the reason the steroids are helpful is because they're anti-inflammatory. So that's how it's going to um, not affect the foot processes. So here's the picture that I was kind of referring to. 
on the left side here, you can see these podocytes are kind of like normal as they're standing up. But on the right side of the picture, you see how these podocytes are basically flattened. So this is the kind of thing that you will see in minimal change disease. So it's the most common cause of nephrotic syndrome, often idiopathic, but may trigger by recent infection, immunization, or immune stimulus. Uh, rarely may be secondary to lymphoma. Again, again, that's due to the cytokine mediated damage by the reed sperm blood cells. And primary disease has excellent response to corticosteroids because of the anti-inflammatory effect. Light microscopy, you're going to see normal, nothing. You may see lipids in the PCT, but that's because of the disease process itself. Immunofluorescence will also be negative. And then um, in the electron microscope, you'll see effacement of the podocyte foot processes as this is another picture. And as you can see, these guys are flattened. So keep something to look back at too. Next, we'll talk about focal uh, segmental glomerulosclerosis. So when you think of glomerular sclerosis, you want to think of pink dense deposition of collagen in the glomerulus. Um, it's segmental because it only affects a portion of the glomerulus. Um, so in this picture here, this is the affected glomerulus. However, there is other glomerulus here that are normal. So that's why I said only portion is involved. And um, only some of the glomeruli are involved. So that's why it's focal. So you can add these words and make focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So when you talk about this, um, uh, in renal biopsy, you're going to see focal segmental lesions and light microscopy. Uh, electron microscopy, you can see effacement of the foot processes as well. And immunofluorescence, usually negative. There is no immune complexes. However, sometimes you may see IgM, C3, and C1, but those are non-specific findings. Um, this disease is caused by podocyte injury, and it's common in Hispanics and African Americans. There are unknown causes. However, there's been associations with HIV, sickle cell patients, and patients who have used heroin. And some other associations that have come about are patients who have massive obesity, uh, patients who use interferon treatments so for uh, hep C or hep B, and also the loss of nephrons. So if you have a signal, single kidney, it's a congenital issue. So some of these patients have been seen to have focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or surgical kidney removal. And this often progresses to chronic renal failure. So this is the most common cause in nephrotic Nephrotic syndrome in African American and Hispanics, as we've covered, the primary cause is uh, idiopathic or secondary to other conditions, and those are listed here. Basically, everything that I've covered, um, and the primary disease has inconsistent response to steroids, so and may progress to chronic kidney de uh, disease. So, in light microscopy, you're going to see segmental sclerosis and hyalinosis. And that's seen right here. And immunofluorescence is often negative, but has non specific focal deposits of IgM, C3, and C1. And same thing with minimal changes, is you're going to see effacement of foot processes. So, membranous um, has a thick glomerular basement membrane and absence of hypercellularity, which is a big key. Um, so the membrane is thick from immune complex deposits, such as, so immunofluorescence is very useful, and you're going to see granular deposits of IgG and C3 under staining. Um, and let me get my page right here, because I have to kind of explain this picture. So what we're seeing here is the immune complex are depositing against the subepithelial region, so they're right below the podocytes, and that's represented in the uh, these purple segments right here. So then that's happening on top of the basement membrane. So when these deposits, what happens is they disrupt the filtration barrier to protein. Um, and basically what they do is 
when these basement membranes will start building again on top of these protocytes. So it basically causes this spike in dome appearance because these protocytes are building on top. Um, so they lay down extra basement membrane, essentially, these protocytes. And that happens on top of these immune complexes. So when it does that, it kind of forms this spike and dome appearance, as you see down below. So that's why when you're looking at this um, under any sort of electron microscope, you're going to see spike and dome appearance. And we'll cover that very shortly. So membranous nephropathy is the most common cause in Caucasian adults. So it's often idiopathic. Um, and there are some reports about anti autoantibodies to phospholipase A2 receptor that are expressed on podocytes. And secondary causes can be SLE. Um, most SLE is the nephritic diffuse proliferative. Um, but if it's nephrotic, then most probable cause is membranous nephropathy. Secondary causes of um, membranous would be solid tumors such as colon cancer, lung cancer, infections of hep B or hep C, and then drugs such as penicillamine, gold, and NSAIDs. So from first aid, it can basically have anti antibodies to phospholipase A2 receptor, and then secondary to drugs, but also uh, hep B, hep C, and cephalus is another one. Um, SLE or solid tumors such as those. This has poor response to steroids and may progress to chronic kidney disease. So on, uh, where the, I guess I don't have a picture. So on the light microscopy, you're going to see diffuse capillary and glomerular basement thickening. And on immunofluorescence, you're going to see granular uh, due to immune complex deposits. And then electron microscope, this is what I was talking about, the spike in dome appearance on the sub-epithelial deposits. So keep that in mind because they may kind of express that. So we're moving right along to our diabetic nephropathy. And this is due to high glucose that leads to non-enzymatic glycosylation that results in highline arteriosclerosis, arteriosclerosis. And glomerular uh, efferent arterioles affected more than the afferent arterioles, and that leads to a high glomerular filtration pressure. So when you have hyperfiltration, you're going to get microalbuuria. And eventually progresses to nephrotic syndrome, and that's characterized by sclerosis of the mesangium um, with formation of the cumulostein wilson nodules. And ACE inhibitors are known to slow down the progression of hypofiltration and induce damage. So this is the most actually common cause of end-stage renal disease in the United States. And basically, hyperglycemia leads to non-enzymatic glycosylation of the tissue proteins and the mesangial expansion that causes your glomerular basement membrane thickening and increasing in the permeability. Um, so when you have hyperfiltration because you have glomerular hypertension and increased GFR, you get glomerular hypertrophy and glomerular scarring, and that leads to further progression of this nephropathy. Um, mesangial expansion, uh, glomerular basement membrane thickening, eosinophilic glomerular nodular glomerular sclerosis, or chemostein wilson nodules, as you'll see right here in these arrows. These are the chemostein wilson nodules. So um, those are when there, there's sclerosis occurring in the mesangium. So that's what you'll see on light, light microscopy. So the last we'll talk about is amyloidosis, and it's an extracellular building of amyloid protein in the mesangium. The kidney is the most common involved organ, and a classic biopsy finding you'll find the key things that you see with this disease is apple green bifringens or Congo red stain. Uh, so with the Congo red stain, we'll show an apple green bifringens under polarized light. And that's due to the amyloid protein basically depositing in the mesangium. Okay, so this is uh, basically a review slide that kind of helps me put it all together. So with minimal change disease, the thing that you want to keep in mind are your cytokines. With focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, you want to know that it's a podocyte damage causing it. 
with membranous. You want to know immune complexes with diabetes, of course, is your glucose, and then amyloidosis is your amyloid. So this is a quick way of just reviewing each of these drugs and knowing the pathophysiology behind it. So last but not least, we'll talk about our favorite uh, membrane of nephritis. And this can cause either the nephritic or nephrotic syndrome. And there's a varied degree of renal dysfunction. So you can get renal failure, hematuria, and proteinuria, and plus or minus of the nephrotic range because it can occur in both disease processes. Um, and it's membrano because it has a thick basement membrane, and it's proliferative because of proliferation of the mesangial cells in the mesangial matrix. So that's how you can think about this one. All right, and then there are two major types. There's a type 1, which is the most common type, and then there's a type 2, uh, which is also called dense deposit disease, and that's very rare. Um, so as you see here, uh, it's severe nephrotic syndrome with profound uh, glomerular basement damage, and the damages of the glomerular filtration change charge barrier. So you get a nephrotic range of greater than 3.5, but you can also get features of nephrotic syndrome and can occur with any form of nephritic syndrome, but it's most commonly seen um, with these two specifically. Okay, so when you think of uh, membranal peripheral glomerular nephritis and type 1 cause, uh, so here you're going to see subendothelial immune complex deposits such as IgG, and that's to basically activates your complement. So what you see here in purple again are your um, immune complex that are depositing um, on your capillaries or on your basement membrane attaching to your capillaries. So what they do is um, these immune complex deposits then trigger mesangial growth or ingrowth. So as you can see here, it splits the basement membrane into two. And that will basically cause a tram track appearance on light microscopy. And that's commonly seen in about 80% of type 1 patients. So patients who have type 1 membrane or peripheral glomerular nephritis will see a tram track appearance. And that's obviously due to these immune deposits basically triggering a mesangial ingrowth, so causing two basement membranes or splitting. And... This is usually idiopathic, but has an association with Hep B and Hep C infections. So keep that in mind. Um, okay, with type two, uh, this is when you have a basement membrane, uh, electron dense deposits, and it's mediated by complement, but not IgG. IgG is usually not present, and here you're going to see a lot of C3, but not IgG. So when you look at it, C3 will be present. Um, and that basically causes complement overactivation, um, and that's why you're going to see this. And there's an additional factor here. Basically, it's the C3 nephritic factor. So it's found in oh, greater than 80% of the patients with this type, type 2. And what happens is your C3 convertase basically activates the alternative pathway, um, which is your complement pathway. And here it's stabilized by the C3 nephritic factor, uh, which is present in this disease. And that basically leads to an overactivation of the complement system. So you're going to get a decreased level of C3. And most of these diseases is mostly a disease of children between the ages of 5 to 15. And 50% of these develop end-stage renal disease within 10 years. So did that kind of make sense? Sorry, I kind of jumbled a lot in this one. But um, the thing you want to keep in mind is this C3 nephritic factor, basically kind of overproduction of the complement and decrease in C3, which are going to be found right here. So this slide... Um, this is a picture that you commonly associate with um, membrane glomerular, um, sorry, yeah, with membrane proliferative glomerular nephritis. It's a thickened hypercellular um, and a thick basement membrane 
as you can see in this image right here. And what this review table does, it basically breaks the type 1 and type 2. So the pathology is mostly commonly seen with immune complexes, and the location of this is going to be their subendothelial. And your microscopy, you'll see tram track appearance, and it's associated with hep B and hep C. But with type 2, you're going to basically see a complement, or C3 pathology, and it's located in your basement membrane. And you're going to see dense deposits in the electron microscope and associated with children, usually between the 5, five and 15 years of age. So from first aid is a nephritic, but often co-presents as a nephrotic. Type 1 may be secondary to hep B or hep C, but may also be idiopathic. Um, and here you get subendothelial immune complex deposit with granular immunofluorescence. And then type 2 is associated with the C3 nephritic factor, which is just an IgG antibody that stabilizes the C3 convertase. And that persistent complement activation leads to a decrease in the C3 levels. And intramembranous deposits also called dense deposit disease. So this is the second name of it. And in both types, mesangial ingrowth, your uh, glomerular basement membrane splitting, and the tram track appearance on this image here. Um, this little tram track appearance. And then, as you also see here, on different types of stains. So this is an HNE stain, and then this is a PAS stain. So that's it for me as far as these material goes. Does anybody have any questions before I have some questions for you guys? Mm -hmm. All right, sorry, it was kind of a lot, but well, I have a few questions for you guys and then it can be done. So here you have a 44-year-old man with type 1 diabetes for the past 32 years. He used insulin to treat his diabetes, but his blood glucose levels are poorly controlled. Over the, past, over the years, he has developed painful peripheral neuropathy and a non-healing diabetic foot ulcer. Recently, he has experienced increased urinary frequency, which prompted him his visit to the physician. His temperature is 99.7, blood pressure is 156 over 96, heart rate is 74, and respiratory rate is 17. Which of the following would be the most likely found on biopsy of this man's kidneys? B. What'd she say? B. Okay, I uh, B. Um, all right, so Divya, you are correct. The answer is B. Do I need to explain it, or you're okay? Uh, Kimmel Stone wants some nodules, nodule changes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, basically, you have an increase in the mesangial matrix, and that's marked by the nodule accumulations known as the singles and nodules. Oh, there you go. Um, with A, this answer, the crescent shaped, obviously it's your rapid progressive uh, or crescentic glomerulonephritis. With C, which was um, your proliferation of the mesangial membranes, um, that's basically membrane of peripheral glomerulonephritis, and that affects younger individuals. And that's diagnosis based on uh, proliferation of the mesangium. D was segmental sclerosis and highline cast, and that's focal segmental. Um, it's a nephrotic disease, which because this patient also had diabetes kind of rules it out and then you're going to see young hypertensive african-american male um when obesity and hiv are also positive risk factors and then the last one the tram track appearance on like microscopy is obviously membrane or peripheral glomerular nephritis so you could rule the other ones out based on that all right another question um a 26 year old man presents his doctor with a two-day history of blood in his urine and hemoptysis. A kidney biopsy is obtained while the tissue is stained with fluorescent anti-IgG antibodies. The staining reveals a linear pattern. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Good passion. Correct. Good job. So the big key here is the linear and then the anti-basement um, membrane antibodies or anti-IgG antibodies. Um, and then 
I added this year in him up or him up to since it wasn't actually there before. Uh, but that's also a good clue because kidney and lung disease or lung association. So, um, so here, yeah, forming against a tissue. So basically, I covered that. But if you need me to explain it more, I can. Okay. Okay. All right, and then. One more. A 41-year-old woman presents to her physician with a complaint of blood in her urine and a decreased urine output for the past few weeks. She has a sore throat three weeks ago, which has since resolved. Her temperature is 37, heart rate is 72, and blood pressure is 150 over 94. A physical exam reveals bilateral pedal edema to the, to the mid-calf. Uh, in addition to the severe uh, several serologic tests, the patient undergoes a renal biopsy and the image you see below. Which of the following is the most accurate diagnosis? E. Okay. What makes you think of E? Um, because she had a sore throat three weeks ago and... Um... There's edema and um, blood in her urine, and can't really tell the renal biopsy. Okay, so the thing that you want to keep in mind here, I mean, yes, you're right as far as the breakdown of the disease process, but the answer is actually F. <sighs> and that is because you, do you see a crescent shaped here? Mm. And that's the clue. Because this is normal, I'm assuming, and then this is your crescent shape. The, the explanation doesn't really explain the picture as much, but um, but as far as what you said, you were on the right track. Um, so with this one, the classic scenario demonstrates a nephritic syndrome, which you got that right, with the hematuria, oligouria, and hypertension. So one would expect with... Uh, I mean, it's kind of close because the biggest key here was the image. So if you got this image, you got the answer. But yes, post-treptococcal glomerulonephritis is a nephritic syndrome. And that occurs 10 days after pharyngitis infections, which is two weeks. Um, but you would see without crescents in that one, which shows some epithelial humps. So that would be more of an image that had like a little hump on it. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. that's the deposits. So, um, but this is a good secondary. It's a confusing question, but that, but that's the right answer because of the crescents here. That's all I got. Any questions? Oh, by the way, in addition to that, your what you said about uh post-streptococcal can progress to rapid progressive glomerulonephritis. So yes, you are right, but I think this one progressed a little bit more and then because of the crescent shape, that's mm -hmm. the reason why you're choosing that answer. Mm -hmm. But good job on your differential there. <laughs> I hear so <laughs> throat and I'm like, strep! <laughs> yeah, I know. I actually made the same mistake. That's why I thought it's a good question to um, throw in here.